Good morning. How's everybody doing? A little bit of snow out there. What do you guys think? Anybody making a snowman? <laughs> snow ice cream. Hey, would you please stand? And the words of this song are, Lord, how you love me, I don't deserve grace on top of grace. Uh, God just continues, continues to bless us, even though we don't deserve it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this awesome time that we can come and worship and learn from your word, Lord. May we, we strive to be, be, be uh, better disciples, Lord, and more informed. And uh, May you give us something today that we can uh, take out into the world and uh, apply to our Christian lives. And as we bring the gospel to others, Lord, may we, we do so with boldness. Uh, Lord, we just thank you. Pray that you would bless this service, pray that your Holy Spirit would work through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's a weird song. sounding a little bit like a banjo. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so so good to me the 
before I took a breath, you breathed your whole life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Sing with me now. Oh, the Praise to God, right? Thank you. 
So today we're looking at God's Hased love pursues. That, that Hased is that mercy, that loyal love that God has for us. We looked at it last week. And in, uh, as a matter of fact, in chapter 1 last week, we saw the indictment that God in verse 2 said, For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. And that's the indictment that God has against Israel early on. He, they departed from the Lord. They look like they're praising and worshiping God, but they're really not. They've departed. And so the Lord uh, instructs Hosea to take a wife of harlotry, and he marries her. And God says, this is going to be the illustration that I use to draw Israel back to myself. I'm going to show Israel's behavior through Hosea's lifestyle. Uh, and so I thought about that in this morning, and I was looking at it. And, you know, God is using this man's life and his marriage as an illustration. And, and you know, the thing that, that really stuck out to me is, because I always try to ask the questions for me. And so the question I asked for myself this morning was, what does my life illustrate about the Lord God that I love and serve? How, how am I representing him in a world that's uh, lost and confused and hurting right now? I mean, these are crazy days. And so uh, am I pointing people back to the Lord? And I mean, we have to, I think we have to personalize it too, because are we being vocal right now? I mean, look at what's going on. There's, a, it's a, it's a time like no other. And so we know his, his return is imminent. And so, I mean, I say I believe. I, I say I'm a Christian. But do I live like it? Do I, do I point people to the living God? You know, the Bible reminds us that we're ambassadors for Christ, that we're, we're those representatives on behalf of God. And so in, and am I living in such a way that I'm representing Christ and the Savior and the Father correctly? I don't want to just be that Sunday Christian that comes in on Sunday and then I live like H-E double hockey sticks the rest of the week. I want to be that one that when the world sees me, I look different than they do. You know, so that was a, one of the early on takeaways that the Lord shared with me because I want to be living in a way that I want to look different than the world. I mean, we're supposed to look different, right? When we name the name of Christ and we say we believe, our lives are supposed to change. We're supposed to be a different person, a new creation. Amen. So last time we also looked at the Canaanite gods that the Israelites were playing the harlot with, uh, the Ashtaros, the Baals, the Milcom, uh, Molech, Shemesh, to name a few. And these were gods of the Canaanites who they, when God gave Israel the, the land, these were the gods of the people that were in the land already. And so they were there and they started they grabbed on right away because a lot of these gods had to do with sexuality and temple prostitution and such. And so they, the children of Israel gravitated towards that. And we saw that God warned Israel 
in chapter 1 that he warned them. He says, hey, judgment's coming for your idolatry. These, these relationships that you have with these other gods and with these peoples, there's judgment coming. And it was a warning that was intended to encourage Israel to come back to the Lord. And we're going to be talking about that because the thing that we keep seeing is that God is continually calling people back to himself. He wants them to return to himself. He wants to draw them to himself. And, and they, he wants them to be in truth and righteousness. I mean, he is the maker of heaven and earth and the giver of all life. And, and why would we go and sacrifice and do serve other gods? Amen. So we learned that the warnings definitely go unheeded. The northern kingdoms were exiled in about 700 B.C., somewhere in there. And we saw that that was because they failed to turn and repent of their sin. Uh, we learned that the judgment could have been avoided. And that's really the heart of the message of the gospel, isn't it? God says uh, we're all sinners and we're doomed for the judgment. But I provided a way for you to be saved. And that is the heart of the message because the wages of sin are death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And then, so the judgment can be, can be avoided. A lot of times people say, well, why do I need a change? Why do I need Christ? Well, the reality is, is we're sinners apart from Christ. And sometimes even in Christ, I drop the ball. But also there's a day coming when he's going to judge. And he's going to judge the world. And so there's, that's the reason we need Christ. Hebrews 9 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And you see, so we can, but we can avoid that judgment. By accepting Christ as our Savior, by surrendering our hearts to God, we can avoid the judgment that's to come. Just like Israel could have repented of her sin, she could have turned, and she would have been forgiven, and God would have taken her back into the fold. You see, but the bad news is... This judgment is coming. And when we hear the bad news, it makes the good news the greatest news. Because then we realize that we have a Savior that wants to pull us out. He doesn't want us to go through judgment. Amen? <clears throat> and as, as ambassadors, I want us to remember these two things. We should present the whole counsel of God. And that's why it's important that we don't just talk about Christ is love and grace, and that's all it is, and it's grace and grace and grace, and it, become, it can become a little bit greasy because there's so much grace that I can just slip, a slide, slip and slide around and do whatever I want to do. And that's not what it's intended for. You see, there is a time when God is going to judge the nations. He's going to judge all of those who reject Christ. And so we want to present the whole counsel so that people understand what they're believing and what they're listening to. And so the, the whole counsel is that, yeah, there's judgment, but there's also a Savior that spares us from that judgment. His name is Jesus. The second thing we want to do as ambassadors is we want to do and represent for God in love. Romans says that his kindness draws us to repentance, not his judgment. So I don't want to be out there on the street corner condemning and judgment is coming and woe is you and you better get right or get left and... It's not love. And so we want to do it in love. We need to be mindful of our attitude towards it. I mean, after all, God's desire is to have compassion and mercy on the sinner. I mean, he did it for us, right? He had compassion and mercy on me. He's had compassion and mercy on you. And his desire is also to have compassion and mercy on the souls of men. He wants to restore the wayward sinner to a right relationship with himself. And that goes from Israel to Gomer to us to the lost. God wants to restore what was broken way back in the garden. You see, he takes no pleasure in disciplining his children. He doesn't like it. It's not, that's not his first goal. His first goal is not to let me see who I can spank today. He doesn't sit up there with a big stick saying, let's see who we're going to whack. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 says, and the word of the Lord said, I, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Now that death that he's talking about there, the death of the wicked, do you think that's just a physical death? I mean, it could be because when we breathe our last here, we're locked into eternity, right? So whether we, whatever choice we made, 
whether for Christ or not, when we breathe our last here, we're locked into that decision. There is no, well, I'm going to talk to God when I get there and we'll figure it all out. It doesn't happen. No, but I think he's talking about the second death. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the second death being the death that sends them and casts people who rejected Christ into the lake of fire. And I think that's the death he's talking about. You see, any, book, any name that's not written in the Lamb's book of life will be eternally separated from his maker. And that's not God's desire. What did we just sing in that song, Relentless? Your reckless love chases me down till I'm found. No mountain you won't climb, no hill you won't, you know, no lie you won't tear down. He's, he's for us. And so he doesn't take pleasure in disciplining his children. He doesn't take pleasure in uh, the death of the wicked. And that's why in chapter 1, the last time we saw the yet, remember, God said, this is what I have against you, and this is what's going to happen. But he says, yet, I will relent. I will have mercy if you will turn from your sins, if you will repent. And the yet revealed the promise of restoration. So if you turn, I will have mercy on you. He promised that they will be his people and he will be their God, that he will show mercy. That's the kind of God we serve. Yes, he's a righteous God, and he's just, and he has to exact justice and judgment. But he also gets to lavish with love and mercy and grace that has said love. And that's the beautiful, the beautiful thing about our God. And so while this promise was made to Israel, directly to Israel, it can be applied to us, the church. Because when we blow it, when we turn away and go after our own desires, when we serve the gods that we have now today with different names, same behaviors, different names, he's there. He's ready to, to relent and to restore when we repent and we turn back to our God. Amen? And so what about the world then, James? Well, the world too, it applies to the sinner as well because God wants to restore what was broken in the garden. That's why Christ came and died on the cross. And so when he come, when a sinner turns and repents, God welcomes him and restores him as well. That's how we all got here. That's why we come on Sundays, because we've been restored. And we want to hear what the Lord has for us. And it's because he chases us down and he wants to have mercy on us. He doesn't just dispose of the wicked or the evil. Too often we think because our sin is so great and our failure, that our failures are final. Oh, you don't know what I've done. You don't know my God. We think that he turns his head and that he's finished with us, that he just wipes his hands and he's like, oh, you're out of here. Get out of kick rocks. Wicked, evil person. That's not our God. He's doing things in their lives that we don't get to see. For the same reason he does those things in our lives, to draw them to himself. You see, he wants nothing more than to welcome us back to full restoration. And that's why today's message is God's Hased pursues, because Hased never stops pursuing you and I. It never lets up. We're going to see today that everything that God does in the lives of his people is for their restoration, for their good, to draw them close to him, to restore them back to that place of fellowship. Amen. And so in chapter two, we're in Hosea chapter two. He's a minor prophet. He's right after Daniel. So we're in Hosea chapter 2. And chapter 2 actually opens up with a second indictment. We saw the indictment in the first chapter 1, and now we see a second indictment in, against Israel. And from the language, it reads as if Gomer has actually left Hosea now. The wife he took with harlotry, she is actually gone now. And so let's, let's read chapter 2, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. And so it sounds like that she's left Gomer and she's thrown off all restraint and she's actually just doing whatever she wants there in, in Israel, serving other gods. And she, you know, in... Uh, 
the corruption, the result of her corruption and the result of her thing is a perfect example of the way Israel is indeed behaving towards the Lord. They've thrown off all restraint. They're no longer trying to pretend. I mean, it's, it's kind of a sad commentary when you look at it and when you think about it. But look at the result of her adulteries. Look what the Lord says. He says, not my wife, nor am I her husband. You know, that's covenant language. Back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and with the children of Israel through Abraham. And he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you also to give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so it sounds like he's saying, uh, you're broken covenant with me. You're not in covenant relation anymore. You're not my wife, and I'm not your husband. You know, and that's, that can be a scary place to be. So just as Gomer's adultery broke the marriage covenant with Hosea, And Hosea, by law, had the right to stone her to death. So technically, she would be dead to him in her adulteries. And so, too, it is with Israel. Because they've broken God's covenant, God has a right to disown and to do what he wants with his children. But we we know and we see again, yet. Hosea has said love says, let her put away her sin. Look at verse 2. Look at that second one. That about... Third, third, third line in my Bible says, let her put away her harlotries. That's how said love again, saying judgment is coming. You're failing, but put it away. Come back to me. And that's the beauty of the said love, that loyal love. It's it continually pursues. This is pursuit. God says, I could do this, but I prefer to do this. Don't go there, he said. You see, it's another plea for Israel to turn from her ways. And let's look at the last half of verse 2. There's a reference, I believe, in verse 2. It says, um, you see where it says, let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breast. Apparently, the temple prostitutes used to wear these headbands and they hang, around, hang down in their eyes and they have these things and they were like hangy things and they like, you know, maybe you've seen them on belly dancers or something or whatever, but they were like these things that would have indicated that she was a temple prostitute. And the, 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 the put away the harlotries from between her breasts, there would have been some kind of augmentation or addition to her garb that would have accented or highlighted her breast. And they would have known, there would have been no question that, they were, that she was a temple prostitute. And he's saying, let her put these things away. So it sounds like she's dug head first straight into harlotries. There's not even any question. She's left her husband and she's over there doing whatever it is uh, they do at those temple prostitution things. So he's telling her to put them away. You see, Gomer and Israel at one time both may have been discreet, but now they both have cast off all restraint. And like Israel and Gomer... Gomer has left her faithful husband, Hosea, and Israel has left her husband, the Lord God Almighty. And so she's become a picture of unfaithfulness. And Israel is a, a, a people of unfaithfulness. So let's look at verse 3, Gomer's chastisement. Verse 3 says, Least I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and I make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Look at that least, that first word, least. So he's saying, let her put away her harlotries, put it from between her eye, from in her sight, and between her breast, least. Again, there's another love plea. There's a plea that God is saying, you're going to make me have to do something I don't want to do. I don't want to harm you. I don't want to send you into judgment. And so that word least is, is another call for, for coming back. Turn. If you don't turn, this is what's going to happen, he says. Or else. It's almost like an or else. But God doesn't want that. The result of not turning and your sin and your shame will re- be revealed, he said. I will reveal your shame openly and publicly. You may have been discreet at one time, but all the nations are going to see 
your, adul your adulteries and your idolatry. Look at the last three lines. This is, would be a call to remembrance right here because if you look at the last three lines, what does it say? Of verse 3, like a wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness, right? He brought them out of Egypt into the Exodus and they were in the wilderness. Uh, you, he says, I will make her a dry land. Remember when God split the Red Sea, they walked through on dry land. So these are references that God is using. Look, I will slay her with thirst at the well of Marah. They, they complained and murmured against the Lord. And God gave them water. And it, they called that well Marah, which means bitter waters, is because they were moaning and complaining. Did you bring us out of the land of Egypt to kill us in the desert? And so we see that God is reminding them and calling them back to a time when they, he was everything they needed, when they relied on him for everything, the manna, the direction in the wilderness, the escape from their enemies in the Red Sea. And so he's calling them to remember where I have brought you from. I brought you out of slavery, he says. What a, what a picture for us and for them. I mean, I broke the chains of slavery, and this is how you're going to treat me? You're going to act like uh, the rest of the world? Your behavior, look at verse, let's look at verse 4 and 5. Five, part, half of 5. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are, play, they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. <clears throat> For she said, I will go after my lovers. What, a, what an indictment. I mean, these children are children of harlotry. He's reminding them that they're going to be children of harlotry. He's, he's calling them away from that. He's saying, I'm not even going to have mercy on them. Your sin is blocking mercy on these children of harlotry. Your continued har harlotries and adulteries. And shameful, shameful behavior are separating you from God's mercy, from God's has said love. That's a startling thought. But let's move on to verse 5b, the second part of that verse, the charge. Look at 5. It says, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. And so here they are, she's attributing all of the blessings that come from God to these false gods. See, look, she says, all my lovers, they give me everything I need. They give me my food, they give me my water, they give me my clothing, they give me my bedding, they give me a place to live, they give me oil, they give me drink. I mean, they're attributing all of these things, these good gifts, these blessings from God to false gods. What a... What a that's a sad commentary to me. That's like syncretism, it's called. So you take a God, diverse gods, and so you may have like Islam and Christianity, and you try to bring them together, and you're worshiping the two, and you're taking a little bit from this and a little bit from that, and you're trying to say make it work. Or maybe it's like this. Your lips are saying Yahweh, but your heart is saying Baal and the Ashtaros and all the gods of the Canaanites. It's kind of a crazy thing. Even that coexist bumper sticker. What does it say? How can you coexist with one of those or multiple of those that actually want to kill the infidels? How can you take a little bit from that and a little bit from this and you're going down the line at the buffet and you get some of this polytheism and monotheism and, and you got all these different things and it's like the guy that was in the, uh, the foxhole. He had his rabbit's foot, he had his lucky charm, he had his crucifix. Better get a little bit of Jesus just to make sure I got my bases covered. I mean, that's, that's basically what they're doing. They're worshiping God in name. They're giving him lip service while, burn, while bowing down and burning incense to idols with their hearts. Isaiah said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that's, we don't want to be in that place. We don't want to be Christians that come on Sunday, praise you, Lord. And then we're out there living like crazy. That's not for us. And we fall into those tendencies if we're not careful. We're just like Israel. So let's look at the judgment for that behavior. Verses 6 and 7. Therefore, behold, I will hedge you. I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. She will seek them, but not find them. So 
and I'm, I'm splitting these verses in half intentionally because there's more than one point on these. But did you see what she said? She's going to he's going to hedge her up. God's going to make her way difficult. You know, you're going to worship. You're going to seek these other gods. That's worshiping. You're going to make petitions. You're going to do these things to these false deities. You're going to all of these things. God says are not going to bring an answer. You can sacrifice multiple bulls. You can sacrifice all that you want, but you're not going to receive an answer from your lovers. You see, all your endeavors and your pursuits will be empty and vain. Israel will not be satisfied by the adulteries and the idolatries she continues to chase. God says he's going to make sure of it. You know, I kind of get this picture about her trying to chase her lovers. I get this picture of when they're doing a relay race, and one guy's trying to reach behind and the other guy's trying to hand forward the baton, and it's reaching, reaching, and I just get this idea that what she's going to be doing is continually reaching, reaching for that thing, and it's never going to land in her hand. She's going to be continually running, running, waiting, and the guy behind her is like trying to give it, and it's just not going to work out. Or I see in my mind's eye another one, a little more closer to home for us today. I see the guy that work, <clears throat> the employee constantly striving for more, Spending hours at work, sacrificing home life, sacrificing health, sacrificing relationships in pursuit of more, in pursuit of higher rung on the ladder, in pursuit of the American dream, the bigger house, the two cars in the garage, that gal or that guy, all the latest gadgets. I see him striving for all these things. And I see that soul one day waking up and saying, all my pursuits are nothing. but emptiness and sorrow. Because those are some of the things that we chase today. We may not be chasing idols made of silver and gold, but we definitely chase our idols, right? God says Israel will come up empty. And so too it is with us if we're not putting our His kingdom first, if we're not seeking His righteousness. That's the beauty of our God is he continually, even in the midst of us chasing all these things, he's continually pursuing us with that great love that he has. He doesn't want us to have to go through the emptiness and the heartache of all of that pursuit that leads nowhere. Let's look at the purpose of God's hedging her in so that she cannot reach her lovers. In the second part of verse 7, look what the word says. It says, then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. Do you see what happened? All that emptiness, all those vain pursuits, all those idols brought her to her senses. She says, I will go. You see, the short-lived pleasures of sin and lust, they're going to fade, family. As a matter of fact, lust, sin and lust are liars. And they never yield what is promised. You see, they have very good salesmen. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. And you're going you're gonna to be fulfilled. And you're going to have joy. And it's going to be awesome. You're going to just take a little bite. They have a great sales team. But they have a horribly, horribly broken delivery system. They, can never prom- they never deliver what they promise. It may look good. And it may be pleasurable for a season. But its benefits and its payments are out of this world. You see, all the vain pursuits that promise great gains, they pale in comparison to the love that God has for Israel, for Gomer, and even for us. And it's not until Israel, and oftentimes it's not until we come to our senses, that then we are willing to come back to our first love and to recognize that God is good. You see, she says, it was better for me when I was with him. How often do we fall into that same trap? We go and we partake of what the world has, and then we come to our senses and, oh, my God, here I am, Lord. And we come back. And so we start to see that God uses these things, these empty promises that the sin and lust offer, these unfulfilled promises. He starts, we start to see that he uses those to draw us back to himself. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. You may remember the story. He told his father, give me my inheritance. I'm, I'm ready. I'm out of here. 
basically by asking for the inheritance, he said, you're dead to me. Give me my money now. So he took that money, and the word tells us that he went and he squandered all the money of, that his father gave him on reckless, wild living, the word says. <clears throat> so much so that a famine came in the land, and he had nothing, and he ended up in the pig's sty feeding pigs. And this is what the word of the Lord says in Luke 15, uh, verse 16 and 17. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? So I highlighted that verse. I capitalized those verses, those lines in those verses, because think about it. No one gave him anything. Now, I used to have enablers in my family, and I used to be enabled a lot. And so this verse is for you enablers today. How can we expect them to come to their senses if we keep giving them everything they need in their life of sin and misery? I didn't understand that when I was a heathen and I wanted it to give me, give me, give me, but I understand it now. And God says he uses the consequences of reckless living to draw this man back to himself. He does the same thing in our lives. He draws us through the things that we go through, through the consequences of choices that we make. In Psalm 119, the word of the Lord says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You know, that's the truth, isn't it? I can go astray real easy. I can go off on a tangent if I'm not careful. But it's the affliction that brings me back to the word. That brings me back to my God. He pursues me even in the midst of the affliction with his great Hased love to draw me back to himself. He, he does that. He does it for you too. Sometimes we don't even recognize that God is doing it. Those things that we think are roadblocks or we, or God is saying, no, come back over here. He uses those things because his love pursues God uses the affliction, the correction, the consequences of our sins and to draw not only Israel, but also us back to himself. What a great truth for us, because maybe we've gone astray. Maybe we're not where we're supposed to be. He's drawing you. He's pursuing you. He wants that relationship with you. Lamentations chapter three says this. Says for the Lord will not see, will not cast off forever, though he causes grief. Yet, there's our word, yet, he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. God doesn't, that's not God's first choice. God doesn't want to just lay the hammer on us. Amen? Isaiah 54, verse 7 and 8, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you, and for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. You see, even in judgment, even when we think that these things are harsh penalties, God is still pursuing us with that great said love, because he desires that. He doesn't want to take us to the back of the woodshed. And can I just say that there's nothing wasted in God's economy? Whatever you're in, that situation, whatever the thing is going on, the broken relationship, whatever it might be, it could be a thousand things that will not be wasted in the economy of our king because he doesn't discard, he restores and he, and he repairs. Amen? Let's look at verse 8. We're getting closer. For she did not know that I gave her her grain and her new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. So the reality check, the Lord says, is that everything Israel had was from him. It's the same for us today. Everything we have is from God. The Bible says he even gives us the ability to make wealth. It's not something that I was like inherently like learned on my own. Oh, look, I can do this. It's from him. I'm, I'm a super manager. It's from him. He, you see, he gives the early rains and the latter rains to ensure good harvest. 
He's the one that causes the flocks to, infler- to flourish. He's the one that gives the ability to make wealth. You see, and Israel took all of these provisions and all of their wealth, and they offered them to the balls, he says in verse 8. These false gods made of wood, silver, and gold. It's ironic because the silver and gold was probably used to make more idols. And, and, and God says, all of those things come from me. She didn't know that I'm the one that provided them. See, the prodigal son turned what was supposed to be a blessing because an inheritance is a blessing, right? You want to leave your kids something behind, right? You want to be able to say, here, be blessed, and, and you might not have to struggle as much as I did, right? But they, he took what was supposed to be a blessing, and he turned it into wild, levacious living. And also Israel does the same. She continually turns God's good provisions and blessings into avenues for sin and idolatry. And I'm just going to put it out there because a lot of us, you know, the word was written for our admonition, for our example. And so there's always a principle that can come through for us to apply here, right? And I think one of these that we have to be careful in this too because if we're not careful, we take God's good blessings, his good gifts, and we too turn around and turn them into avenues for sin. And that's, you know, we're just like Israel. We're just like Gomer. We're prone to idolatry. We're prone to worship our identity, our position. We're prone to worship him or her. We're prone to worship these things. And, and we use all the blessings that God gives us towards that idolatry. And we turn it into an avenue of sin. Oh, the names may di- be different, but the gods are the same. Verse 9 and 10. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain. He says it's his. It's my grain in its time and my new wine in its season. And I will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. And so in verse 9 and 10, God says, because you have done this, I'm going to take away all my provision. There's going to be a blight. It could be a blight. It could be a drought. It could be whatever it is. The, the rains aren't going to come. The, he's going to do away with all of their provision if they don't turn from their sin. You know, the Lord in, through Job said, uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. We came naked and we're going to go naked. We take nothing with us. And so we think that these things are ours and we want to hold on to them. And he says, I'm going to take them all away. And on top of that, in verse 10, he says, I'm going to humiliate you because I'm going to expose your sin and your nakedness to all the nations around you. All these nations that you continue to try to hire out to help you instead of coming to me for your help. You continue to reach out to these people to be your strength. They're not even going to be able to save you. Verse 11. And I will cause her mirth to cease. That's like a giddy, happy spirit, party, joy, goodness, you know. Her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. He's going to cause all of that to stop. Because here's another element of God's correction. You will no longer be able to celebrate the feast. Why? Because when you're in captivity, they're not going to let you come back to the temple to honor me. You see, he's reminding them that these feasts were appointed for certain reminders. They were reminders of his goodness, of his time in the in the desert that he had brought them out of the feast of booths and all these different things for had very specific reasons. And they were remembrances of God's hand bringing them through Egypt, out of Egypt. And it's a reminder of God's setting them free from slavery. And he says, you're not going to be able to do these things anymore. And you're just going through the motions anyway, so we might as well take them away from you. In Isaiah, Hosea is not, Hosea is not the only prophet that speaks about this. Isaiah chapter thir- 1 verse 13 talks about it too. And, you know, and I've been reading this and studying it. It's in almost every single prophet. These types of warnings against judgment that's coming is in every single prophet. That's what the prophets are doing. They're warning the children of Israel that you need to turn and change your behavior or judgment is coming. And so bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. 
They are trouble to me. I am weary of them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. And here's the kicker. You have blood on your hands. That's the bad part. We're the reason that these things are being cut off. Oftentimes, Israel has got her part, but we also have our part. Verse 12. Praise the Lord. Two more verses. And I will destroy the vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. See it again. She's saying, These are my wages from my lovers. And so I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. Look at that. The grain which comes in the latter part of the year is gone, right? He's saying, I will destroy the grain. And now the Lord is taking away the provision from the early part of the year. So in the early part of the year, you got the fruit-bearing trees are giving its provision. And in the latter part of the year, you got the grain. And God's saying, I, my judgment is complete. I'm going to take it all. That's a, that's a sobering thought. Because when God does lay out judgment, it's going to be complete. You know, we often cling to the promises of God, the good ones that we like. I'll be with you forever. But we, we want to neglect the ones that say my judgment is going to be complete. That's a promise. God never goes back on his word. Amen. He always keeps his word. Verse 13. I will punish her for the days of the Baals to which she burned incense. She decided she decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. Wow. Wow. I changed the end this morning of the message because when I reread that this morning before I came in, the Lord, it really struck me. She decked herself with her earrings and her jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. You know, we make ourselves ready for all sorts of things. She made herself ready. She gave attention to her appearance. She put on her garb. She got ready. She cleaned herself. She, got, she went out after her lovers. We do the same. We invest time. Uh, we invest the time needed to prepare and get ready for to do all sorts of things. Good things, not necessarily bad things. We go to sporting events. We, go, we plan for retirement. We plan for vacations. We do all of these things. We chase careers. We make ready. We take and spend the necessary time to train and to learn and to grow into that position. And I want you to hear my heart this morning. I'm not condemning those things. There's nothing wrong with a career. There's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with planning and retirement and going to and having social gatherings and being blessed, right? God gives good gifts. And so my heart is not condemning these activities, but I just have to wonder, are we forgetting him in the midst of all of that? Because the reality is it's easy to get caught up in thinking as long as I don't smell like sparkle, I'll be all right at the party. But the Lord is there for us. Are we caught up with these tools? You see, they are tools for life. Those things are good things. Those tools for life and they're gifts. But do we forget the giver? Do we forget to spend time in his word? Do we forget to talk to him? Are we making ourselves ready? Look, she made herself ready to go commit adultery. To be a, a harlot at the temple. She put on her stuff. She put on her best. Jewelry and, and, and her things, those speak of the best, right? You have that set of earrings that when you go somewhere special, you wear it, right? Because they're the best. She, that's the idea behind what she's doing. Are we giving him our best? He's coming again for a bride without spot or blemish family. He's coming for us. And the day is closer than we realize. There's nothing biblically that keeps him from splitting this planet with his feet. Nothing. Are we working on and making ready our hearts? She took time to get ready. Are we making time? Am I striving for holiness? Am I cleaning this temple? Am I making this vessel one of honor so that he'll have a place to reside that isn't all full of junk? 
Am I giving him access to the room that I have in the back that nobody knows about? So today we saw that God is continually drawing Israel and Gomer and us by proxy because of the relationship we have with Christ. He's reaching out with his Hased love, his mercy, that loyal love that never fails. He's continually reaching out to us. We saw even that everything that God allows in our life or in our lives is for the purpose of drawing us closer to him. Those things that we think are hindrances or roadblocks are actually a said love drawing us close to him, intended to bring us close to him. The pain, the consequences of sin, the discipline, the heartache, the misery, the holiness, not even those, but not just those, the joy, the victory, the success, the triumphs, all of those victories, all of those things, everything that is in our lives is intended to draw us closer to Christ. It's intended to draw us back and closer to our Father because He gives good gifts. I said love pursues. God so loved the world that He gave. He took the initiative. He pursues us. I'll leave you with a scripture and a question. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God? And I just want to say, I could have pulled this from Matthew in verse 22 because it's the greatest commandment. They asked him, what is the great commandment? But I want to show you God's heart in the Old Testament because a lot of people say the God of the Old Testament is not the same as Jesus in the New Testament, but this is God's heart, and this is what Christ quoted in the New Testament. And so this has always been God's heart for us, amen, and for Israel. So what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. That's his intent. That has always been God's heart, is for our good. He doesn't want to lay judgment on us. He doesn't want to have to discipline us. And so what if, what if we pursued God like he pursues us? Think about that, what that would look like. We make ready for all sorts of stuff. But what if we pursued him? like he pursues us. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this morning, and what a great God you are, and you just blow us away with your unfailing, loyal, hased love, your mercy and your kindness that is all wrapped up in that hased love. You chase us down, as the song says, you fight for us. It's a reckless love of our God who will do whatever it takes to bring us back, even if it means pain. When Christ left the 99 to go find the one sheep that was lost, the history tells us that oftentimes that one sheep that was lost, the shepherd would break his leg so that he could not stray. Father, we know that everything you're doing in our lives is for our good. We've seen that today. And we see that you pursue us forever. So Lord, help us to be those that are making ready for you and your return. Give us what we have not, Lord God. Take us where we are not. Keep us where we dare not. And make us what we are not this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, a couple of takeaways I got there. Uh, what will God have to do to get our attention? Um, God wants us to draw close to him. What's he going to have to do? What's he going to have to do to get our attention? And that last, last one that he had, are we making ready for him? Are we getting ready for him? Are we forgetting him in our daily plans and our career and all of that? Uh, let's, uh, let's be focused on Christ. Would you please stand? <laughs>
dismissed if you need to come up for prayer uh, please do so just remember on the you know when you're hitting those doors that's our mission field out there try to take something we learned today uh, to apply to your life and uh, god bless you guys